This video is brought to you by OKCoin Crypto Exchange, where you can buy, sell, and trade your favorite cryptocurrencies, and you don't have to pay high fees. OKCoin has very low fees, lower than many of the other crypto exchanges in the market. You can also stake your cryptocurrencies and keep 100% of the rewards. There are no fees. Other exchanges charge fees. OKCoin allows you to keep 100% of the rewards. Sign up with OKCoin, link in the description. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. With me today is Mark Yusko, who's no stranger to the show. Mark is the founder, CEO, and CIO at Morgan Creek Capital Management. Mark, great to be chatting with you today. No, great to be back together. I cannot believe it's been a year uh, since we, we last chatted. Uh, you reminded me. And I, I just It seems like yesterday, and great to see your, your, your big smile and uh, excited to talk today. Awesome. And I, I'm excited to speak with you because I know you're on the forefront of crypto and investing and all things economy and all that good stuff. So I want to start with, you know, what's new at Morgan Creek Capital and Morgan Creek Digital? Um, any, any updates you can share with us? Yeah. So biggest thing is Morgan Creek Digital is now raising our third venture fund. So we raised a fund in 2018, put that to work, uh, Touchwood doing, doing pretty nicely. Uh, raised second fund in, in 2020 and have put that to work. And now we're, we're raising our third fund. So we just did a first close on that, uh, closed on a little over $80 million and uh, targeting three or 400 million. So a much bigger fund than, than last time. And that, that gives you some indication of, of just what's going on in the space. I mean, the opportunity sure. set is, is incredible. Our deal flow is, is incredible and, and it's really uh, changed. So, so that's the biggest change. Now, the, the other part of that is uh, what's new is in fund one, it was really all about Bitcoin, all about Ethereum, the, the liquid protocols and the infrastructure around getting those to be adopted. So exchanges for trading, liquid crypto, software and tools and data. In fund two, it was still Bitcoin and Ethereum, but a little bit of other things around DeFi and some of the, the newer things. Today, it's the whole plethora of opportunities. So everything from NFTs to the metaverse, to digital identity, to you know so many new, to gaming, uh, to decentralized applications, and just, an, just a true explosion in, in a positive way um of of opportunity so so that's that's new and exciting uh you know we also launched right after we talked we launched a, a risk managed bitcoin fund which is literally a vehicle that allows people to invest in bitcoin and get rid of some of the volatility and one of the things that, that scares people about bitcoin is it's volatile now it's funny it has the same volatility as amazon.com stock and no one seems to worry about that volatility because at the end of the day you're you're higher but it has the same volatility, 80, 80%. Um, imagine an Amazon.com you know, stock having 80% volatility for 24 years. Mm. And you know, it's had a double digit drawdown every year of those 24 years, including this year. The average drawdown is 31%. Scary, right? One third drop, five times more than 50% and twice more than 90%. And I always joke, when was the right time to sell? Yeah, right. Never. Right, but who bought it 24 years ago and held it to today? Jeff, his mom, his dad, and his ex-wife. That's it. And I think same things with Bitcoin. People get shaken out by the volatility, so we created a, a structure that truncates some of the downside volatility and lets people hold on a little easier. Can, can and then I guess the last thing is uh, we are thinking about uh, liquid vehicles for the first time, kind of funds focused just on on liquid liquid crypto. I want to say crypto meaning cryptographically secure assets. So that could be everything from cryptocurrencies to NFTs to gaming to anything that's using blockchain technology in the crypto sphere uh, to, to move us forward. Um, a couple of questions. So you're, you're obviously investing in the assets themselves as well as the companies building the infrastructure. Yep. Um, how are you currently custodying those assets. If yeah, great question. So we were 
in fund one, we were early investors in, in some of the big exchanges and big custodians. So Coinbase would be an example, uh, or BlockFi would be another example. Uh, and, and so for us, you know, we, we do own physical cryptocurrency, both Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, as well as a handful of others. And uh, by and large, the bulk of that is in an institutional account at Coinbase. Uh, we've, you know, we've also looked at others. We're, we're in the middle of making an investment in Gemini, so we're excited about that. So we'll probably diversify our, our custody to include Gemini. Um, then we've also got some relationship, obviously, with BlockFi, so do some stuff there. We also have a, a fund that we jointly sponsored with one of our portfolio companies, Bitwise, called the Digital Asset Index Fund, and, and they do uh, all third-party custody uh, using a number of different different groups, MG Stover and others, um, to manage those assets. So, and that goes a little deeper down into some of the other cryptocurrencies, Monero and Dash, and and uh, and et cetera. So, um, custody is a big deal, and for institutional adoption, it's becoming a bigger and bigger deal. I mean, Coinbase made an announcement recently in their second quarter earnings announcement. They've got ten of the biggest hundred hedge funds now custodying with them in their institutional side. Uh, Gemini is making a big push in an institution, Kraken is talking to institutions. And I think um, those institutional brands are going to be very valuable in the future. So I think it goes without maybe saying or validates what you're saying is that uh, this stigma has gone away around uh, cryptocurrency, some institutions, it seems now it's, okay, everybody rush in. That seems to be the trend. It's not gone completely. It's a great <laughs> point. It's not gone completely. I, I, I say that, you know, four years ago, we go out and talk to 100 people. 90% mm -hmm. were like, go away. Don't call us back. You're, you're an idiot. Um, and of the 10 that would even talk to us, nine said no. So we were getting about 1%. And we had with about 35 uh, investors. Fund two uh, went all the way from 90% saying go away to 70%, which still sounds like a lot, but that was a threefold increase. Sure. And still 90% of those said no, but we ended up with you know 80 plus investors. And today it's up to about 50-50, about half the people are still saying, nope, it's too early. This isn't real, it's big Ponzi, wow. which is crazy to me. Yeah. Um, but that's that means 50% of institutions are out there having meetings, talking about it, getting invested, making their first foray. And that's exciting. And at the end of the day, that's my hashtag, right? Get off zero. We're going to look back in three years. I used to say five, now it's three. Uh, and it will be deemed, I believe, fiduciarily irresponsible to have zero exposure to digital assets. So everyone's got to have exposure. And it's just, this, this is here to stay. The, the technology is not going away. It is going to power the internet of, of things or the internet of value or the trust net, as I like to call it. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're going to run everything on blockchains in the future. The same way we run everything today on, you know, COBOL and Fortran and, and iOS and Android in the future, we're going to run everything on blockchains. And that's great because it's a wonderful uh, system for organizing and storing data. So what do you think would be the catalyst to drive that other 50% who are still on the fence? Would it be an ETF approval for Bitcoin and other crypto assets, no. uh, collapse of other asset classes? What are your thoughts around that? Uh, again, really both really great points. So clearly approval mm -hmm. by some trusted thing. I mean, you see that in, in, in uh, you know, with the FDA approval in air quotes, since they actually didn't get the data to do the approval, but they, they made an approval. I don't know if that's the first time they've ever done that, but but that creates at least a comfort for some. Um, so I do think approval uh, of an ETF would would certainly help some. Um, I think it would be not that big a deal, personally, because there are lots of ways to invest in the equivalent structure like trust at GBTC or Amun in, in Europe, and there's Canadian uh, ETFs. But still, approval would be that good housekeeping seal for some. I think your point on, on a collapse of other assets, you know, right now there's a whole bunch of people who say, why do I need anything else, right? Stocks go up 20% a year, I'm good. 
well, actually, your stocks aren't going up, your dollar's going down. Yeah. That's called money illusion. And that's why if you look at Bitcoin this year, it's up almost three times as much as stocks. People are like, no, it's not true. I'm like, no, it is. And the reason is that Bitcoin didn't get three times better is that the dollar got really bad. They printed way too many dollars post pandemic. And that is coming home to roost and the price of everything, whether it's cars or homes. I mean, North Carolina, where I live, right? My daughter just moved back here. She can't afford to buy a house because housing prices went up 20% in three months. Wow. That never happened before. But there's just so many people leaving the coasts and coming to more rural areas. Right? I think you guys did that. You moved out to the burbs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's real. And that means limited supply of housing stock, increased demand. Now that's bad for prices in major cities. So my son just bought a place in San Francisco at a very nice discount. And I think people in New York are finding discounts, but down here in North Carolina, whew, prices are through the roof, <laughs> pun intended. Yeah, it's been very competitive. Uh, I remember when we were looking for a house and bidding on this house, losing to bid, and it's just, it just was so competitive last year. Yep. Um, so what is your take on the current status of the crypto market? Some are saying, well, there were some saying that we were heading into a bear market because of Bitcoin's correction, but some are saying we're still in the bull market. I personally believe we're still in the bull market. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because how do we define these things, right? If, if we define them by price, right, the old way that securities define bull and bear markets, right? A, a bear market is when an asset corrects in price by 20% or more. We clearly had that in all of the, the crypto related assets, um, kind of April, Mar April, May, June. And so we had a bear market. Now, was that a secular bear market like you know, 2018, 19, or was it a cyclical bear market mm -hmm. uh, a la 2017, right? In 2017, we had what seven, you know, twenty percent or more corrections on the way to to all time highs um, by the end of I, I don't know two thousand eighteen, um, no two thousand seventeen two thousand seventeen uh, yeah. by December two thousand seventeen, and so I I guess I'm in your camp that I think we are still in a secular bull phase. There are cyclical bull phases and secular bear phases in this four-year cycle that we have observed. Now, we've only observed it three times. That doesn't mean it has to happen the fourth time, but so far looks good that you get about a two and a half year period post the halving where you get upward pressure on prices uh, culminating in a FOMO kind of blow off top. Uh, we saw that in 17 and 13 and, and nine. Um, now, whether that happens again in 21, probably. So this fall could, could see some fireworks. Um, that said, it's possible, not likely, but possible that so many people were looking at the same model, right? In 2013, we didn't have stock to flow. In 2017, we didn't have stock to flow. In 2009, we didn't have anything. There wasn't anybody participating. So now everyone was so focused on stock to flow and saying, oh, it's got to be 100,000, got to be 200,000, um, that maybe, maybe some big guys, you know, Michael Burry, Elon Musk, whoever got short early, kind of front run the cycle, and maybe it truncated the cycle. And maybe we are back in a bear cycle that now is going to last two years instead of 18 months. I don't really believe that, but I think it's a non zero probability. So clearly, the bounce from 29,000 to 50,000 in Bitcoin over the last uh, few weeks says it's more likely that we're still in that that secular bull that will culminate sometime you know November December this year um so that's a long-winded way of saying I think you're probably right that we're still in the bull phase we had a cyclic a a cyclical bear in a secular bull and uh you know the, the one thing though that that does give me a little pause, and it's different this time. Mm -hmm. The fundamentals in 17 and 13 kept getting better. Even though the price was very volatile, the, the fundamentals kept getting better. This time, 
the fundamentals did roll over a little bit, right? The, the number of transactions, the transaction size, the uh, total value uh, transacted, all of those things did roll over pretty hard. Now, my thesis on that is we had too much leverage in the system. You know, Binance and others allowed, I think, irresponsible amounts of leverage, 100 to 1, 125 to 1. And whether it was Michael Burry or Elon Musk or whoever it was, triggered that unwinding, that, that catastrophic drop uh, from the 64,000 peak. I think that was intentional, personally. And I think you, you basically liquidated a couple million accounts yep. and transferred those, those Bitcoins from weak hands to strong hands. Now, uh, you know, we see people like Michael Saylor continue to acquire those assets. And I tweeted about this, right? There's an age old trick in, on Wall Street that when you wanted to buy a meaningful position of something, mm -hmm. your first action was not a buy. Yeah. First action was a sell, no. actually a short. Then you would spread rumors that you were selling to push the price down. And then you would buy. Soros was genius at this, right? He'd say, oh, we're, we, we hate copper. And he would push the price of copper down 30, 40%. Then he would buy it all at the bottom and make a ton. And uh, I do actually believe that that went on um, in this latest cycle. And I think that's sad in my mind for the, the people who were, were duped is probably too strong a word, but I think they were duped into thinking that it was a good idea to put a hundred times leverage on and, you know, they had no choice. And, and I, I know from personal family experience, I have a sibling who he wasn't a hundred times levered, but he was highly levered. And he's like, they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, no, nope, they did not steal your Bitcoin. You lost your Bitcoin by making, I believe, a, a bad decision. No one stole it. No one came surreptitiously at night and hacked. You lost it because you didn't put up additional collateral in a margin call. So that's not stealing. That is a mistake. And, and we need to learn from those mistakes. And I think there'll be better controls on leverage going forward, I hope. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it seemed like we ran up too fast. I mean, I don't think Bitcoin has ran up that fast, you know, with, with that type of trajectory. Um, yeah. So let's say that, you know, you mentioned a, a likelihood. We're talking probabilities here because there's no certainties. Um, so let's say the probability is higher for us to still be in the bull market. We're potentially going to see higher prices. Do you, do you have yep. a Bitcoin price prediction? Yeah, you know, what do you say? A good economist says what or when never together. Um, and so I should say, oh, yeah, I, I think, you know, we're going to see $500,000, but I'm not going to tell you when. Now, I will say that it, the, I get the $500,000 price from Bitcoin gold equivalents. Hmm. Uh, I think we see that, I used to say within a decade. So now it's probably within, you know, five or six years. Uh, and I don't think that's a big stretch for us to go from, from a trillion dollars of market cap to, you know, four trillion of market cap, uh, which is to me the monetary part of gold. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's, that's a, a stretch at all um, to get to full gold equivalents at, at 8 trillion. It's a little bit of a stretch, but, but I, I could definitely see that happening over a decade. Um, now this year uh, I used to be, I will say used to be, I used to be in the, the full on stock to flow camp that you know, hundred thousand was was likely this year. Uh, I think that got disrupted by the leverage. So I I think the 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 model I follow now, the Metcalf's law model I follow now, is n squared crypto. Uh, Tim Peterson, I, I really like his model. It's got a better decay factor, and that says you know somewhere in the the mid to high thirties is fair value uh, by the end of this year. I think we we finish higher than fair value. I do think we get a FOMO kind of, you know, speculative blow off here uh, in the fall. Does it take us above the last high? Probably, but maybe not. But probably, if we do right, if we get past the next high, I think we we come close to a hundred. Um, 
but probably don't finish the year there, probably be end of like 17 where we got to 20, but then we finished the year 10. Um, and so as a long, long winded way of saying, uh, I think we probably are somewhere between where we are today and 65 by the end of the year. But I don't like short term forecast because you know my line, right? Price is a liar. I think the daily price of Bitcoin is stupid. I don't think you should pay attention. Anyone should pay attention to it. I don't think it has any information content. It is literally the price at which you and I will exchange a small amount of that good. It has nothing to do with the value of the network. I think the value of the network continues to rise. My big thing, I just I was just part of this thing called the Coins podcast. So everyone should watch that. And uh, it's a you know 12 part series. We've done, released three so far, and it does the history of money and the history of Bitcoin. And and one of the things it talks about is that it's it's all about the next billion, mm -hmm. right? We got you know arguably 200 million people that know about and use cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin. The next billion is what's going to drive the next bull market, and we need that next billion people to to come into the the family and the network absolutely and it seems like el salvador will be a big yeah. part of that next month yeah. uh they're about to make it a legal tender they're going to airdrop free bitcoin to people what are your thoughts on that and do you see other countries following suit yeah, I mean, look, we are we are investors in in strike and jack Mahler's company um zap and uh I'm a huge fan. I think he's awesome. I think he's great for the community. I think he's he's a visionary. He's a he's a passionate uh, you know proponent of of the space. And I think what he did to go down and convince people to to use this and you know look if if I had a mother-in-law in El Salvador, which I don't, my mother-in-law is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But if I had one in El Salvador and I wanted to send her money, she'd get fifty cents on the dollar. That's criminal, right? That's wrong. I mean, that is completely wrong. And that's because we use 400-year-old treaties that the banks cooked up so they get paid when money transfers across borders. You know, Jack can get a dollar, 100 cents on the dollar. Now, that's wrong, too. I don't mean wrong, like morally wrong, but zero is the wrong number, right? There should be some compensation for moving money around the world. Sure. And so they will fix that. They'll figure out a monetization strategy for strike. But uh, I think the Lightning Network is real. I think that that El Salvador moving it to a legal tender status, not the only legal tender, a legal tender. Remember, there's a difference between a something and the something, like a reserve currency versus the reserve currency. The renminbi is a reserve currency. The dollar is the reserve currency. Someday, will the renminbi be the reserve currency? Maybe. Will, the, will Bitcoin be the reserve currency? Maybe. But uh, not today. So I think other countries in Latin America, or we call it decentral land now, you know, tongue in cheek, that, uh, you know, the other countries in decentral land will, will adopt uh, this movement and will start to see increased adoption and usage. And, and that's what it takes, right? It takes communities to engage. It, it uh, you know, journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. And to get to a billion, we need the first, you know, three and a half million. Um, and maybe that's not, now not everyone in El Salvador is going to use it, but, um, you know, it's a tiny little place. And, uh, but if you had Paraguay and you had Guatemala and you had Costa Rica and you had El Salvador, I mean, uh, um, uh, the Philippines and you go across to Asia and you had the Philippines and, and other places now suddenly, you know, maybe you got a, a movement. So, I, I do think places that have historically had high remittance rates and have been abused by companies like Western Union for you know centuries, that's going to end. And I think that's a good thing. For sure. Um, I want to talk about uh, Bitcoin mining. And we've seen what is supposedly a ban from China. But at the end of the day, I think yeah. it's good for Bitcoin because I, I see a lot of miners setting up shop in the United States, which I'm happy about in a decentralized uh, setup of the mining. What are your thoughts yeah. on the whole situation? Look, I mean, banning decentralized things is oxymoronic. It's like jumbo shrimp, yeah. right? Or, or, you know, joke military intelligence. Although I have a lot of respect for military, <laughs> so I, I don't like that one. But um, the reality is, 
it's silly, right? They, they, the Bitcoin was banned in China in 2017. Price of Bitcoin fell 40% in two weeks. And then people realized that, wait a minute, they didn't ban Bitcoin, they banned exchanges. And what'd they do? The exchanges picked up and moved to South Korea and Japan. Japan was like, bring it. You know, we'll just tax it and we'll make a lot of money. So Bitcoin went back up and the same thing happened here. So they banned mining. And you know, why did they do that? Well, China, I say, is playing Go, right? The rest of the world is arguing how to set up checkerboard and China's playing a different game and they're really good at it. And they are setting the stage for the renminbi, the digital form of the renminbi to be the dominant global currency. It's pretty ingenious, right? Right Today, if you live in Venezuela and your dictator basically steals all your wealth through devaluing the currency, what do you do? You go on the streets and you try to find greenbacks. You literally try to find green dollar bills. Or if you were lucky and you had access to the internet, maybe you bought some Bitcoin or some Dash or Monero and you preserved your wealth. Well, China would love to be able to say, hey, guys, buy the renminbi right here online. It's perfectly digital transport. It's easier to go than meeting a guy in the in the back alley with a little thumb drive to exchange your local bitcoins, and you know run the you know wrench risk where you get knocked over the head and they take your bitcoins. So I, I think they're genius in in how they're approaching this. So they basically you know disassemble all the infrastructure around around Bitcoin and say we're going to put the infrastructure in place for central bank digital currency of which they'll have better monitoring, better surveillance, better control. Now, the scary part of this is, just, I don't know if you've seen the video of the BIS guy, you know, this big giant guy yeah. sitting there saying, you know, of, of course we want central bank digital currencies because then we could control how you spend your money or if you spend your money. It's just scary. Shit, are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? You could literally think about, you want a government saying, oh, I'm sorry, you have to buy junk food. Hmm. You have to buy this medicine. You can't go on vacation. That's not approved purchase. And if you don't spend your money by the end of the month, it evaporates. Hmm. That is frightening stuff, dystopian, frightening stuff. So I think, you know, Gresham's law applies. Good money always crowds out bad. And that's why fiat currencies have historically all gone to zero and why cryptocurrencies are gaining adoption and popularity and store of value, and they're going up in value, not down. And so I do believe that these central bank digital currencies will suffer all of the defects and more of fiat currencies, and that ultimately people will opt out for a portion of their wealth. Like I said, I'm not leaving the United States. I'm still going to pay my taxes in fiat. I'm still going to buy my groceries in fiat. I'm still going to fill up my car with fiat for now, but I do own some cryptocurrency and I do own some other assets that are decentralized and a way, you know, I refer to it as schmuck insurance, right? Sure. The schmucks are gonna do what the schmucks are gonna do. And you gotta, you know, be cognizant of that risk and have some assets that aren't seizable and uh, are protected. Um, are you guys at Morgan Creek investing in any of the Bitcoin miners by any chance? You know, we we didn't do mining. The, the challenge I have with, with investing in mining is it's an adverse selection problem. If you're good at mining, you don't need capital because you generate so much free cash flow that you can just plow that free cash flow back in and buy miners. And if you can actually get the miners, you don't need money. The ones that need the money are the ones that have a problem getting the miners. They really don't have great electricity contracts and they need the capital to build the system. And so it was a bootlegging thing and a bootstrapping thing in the early days. And those that won now don't really need capital. So we had this problem in India. You know, we tried to invest in India and, you know, in, in India, you're called a, a promoter, right? The CEO is called a promoter which in, in America, that is a negative connotation. Yeah. In India, it just means you're the CEO. But they are promoters, right? And, and they promote you, meaning if you invest, they take their cut off the top and you don't ever make as much. And it's because their businesses are very cash generative. 
uh, by and large, because the system is set up to, you know, have the big wealthy families own all the, the assets like Reliance. And so we struggled to really make kind of venture capital like returns in, in places like India uh, and China, you know, in the early days of China, right, we'd, we'd invest and the local municipal tax would always equal our profits. Hmm. So they'd never steal our money. They just never let us make any money. Now you can actually make money, but now the problem is, you know, they can change the rules capriciously like they did in, in the, the education space and just wipe out market cap at the, you know, flick of a pen. So it's, it's become tougher. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we, we, it's a long, again, long winded way of saying we, we like mining as a business, don't really like it as an investment. Um, although we've tried. So on the topic of mining, uh, and we, we touched on Elon Musk and, and uh, the pullback after 64,000 ESG, is that a red herring? What, what is that? What is that about? Uh, it's the worst. It's, it's worse than red herring. It's fun. Mm. It's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's a, I mean, it's, it's been, you know, defunct uh, argument for years. Mm. Uh, the idea that, that, Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin uses as much energy as a small country. Okay, let's think about this for a second. Everything in life, everything, what we're doing right now, yeah. everything in life is about converting energy to value, Yeah. right? We are using electricity right now, and we're using energy in our bodies from putting fuel in our bodies to create something we hope of value that educates and enlightens and entertains, Right. That is what the world is. Whether you manufacture widgets, whether you manufacture entertainment, whether you do financial transactions, everything in the world, every day, every minute is about converting energy to value. And the better you are at that and the more efficient you are at that, the wealthier you get. So networks are very good at that. They become, you know, they generate lots of wealth. So this idea that somehow Bitcoin shouldn't use energy is silly. In fact, let's let's just do some some basic math. So, Bitcoin is digital gold, right? It has the function of store of value as gold does. Gold is the only money in the world. Everything else is credit, right? It's currency, and there's difference. Money has to exist in the absence of an associated liability. Gold is the only thing that does that. It has for five thousand years. Money, paper money in particular, fiat money, has all gone to zero. Right, 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters of them no longer exist. The oldest one, the pound sterling, used to get a pound note, got you a pound of sterling silver. Now it gets you know multiple pounds of sterling or multiple pound notes to get a pound of sterling silver. So that's devaluation of the currency. And so if we think about that in terms of 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 generation of value, well, gold. The gold mining industry uses about 60 times as much energy as Bitcoin. Yeah. Now it's about eight times larger than Bitcoin, but 60 is a bigger number than eight. So that's bad. How about the banking industry? The banking industry uses about 2,100 times, not 2,100%, 2,100 times more power than Bitcoin. Oh, but they do more transactions. Yep, they do lots more. And on a transaction basis, Bitcoin's probably not as good, um, but it's not orders of magnitude different. It's marginally different. And the reality is that that idle, empty bank branch that I drive by every day on my way home, yeah. that I haven't set foot in in 10 years, is getting heated and lit and maintenance, you know, done maintenance on it every day for why? Why would anyone go into a bank branch? I use my... ATM, I use my, my app, silly. So there's all kinds of wastage. And the other thing about Bitcoin, and, and this is why the FUD, you know, the, the Elon FUD, and why I think Elon spread that intentionally to reduce the price so he could buy more, mm. which I think will come out later, um, that he did that intentionally. Uh, and that's his classic manipulation, but he's good at manipulation. And so the reality is, um, if you think about, where the marginal miner makes money, 
it makes money with the cheapest electricity, right? Yep. So free electricity is best. Negative cost electricity is even better. So I'll give you an example. So we've been, we actually have invested in a very small way in a Bitcoin mining group that does the following. They go, I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of America at night and it's all black oh, yeah. except for the light in North Dakota and Texas. Yeah. Like what the hell is that? It's flared natural gas. Really bad for the environment. Why are they flaring the natural gas? Literally burning these columns of, of natural gas because there are no pipelines to get out. So when you drill for oil in West Texas, about 10% of what comes out of the ground in hydrocarbons is natural gas. They don't have any pipelines, so they just burn it. That's bad for the environment, bad for everything. So you can now cap that, attach a micro turbine hmm. and a Bitcoin miner, and I can create value from energy that I can transport anywhere in the world, no pipelines, no right-of-ways, no windmills to kill birds, no, no bad nothing, just the internet through satellites. I don't even need wires. Mm. That is amazing. It's positive for the environment. It's net carbon negative, unbelievably valuable, unbelievably good. And I can get paid to do it because the, my, the, the um, oil producer now doesn't have to buy carbon credits so they can burn the uh, natural gas. So that's just one example. And if you think about the cheapest cost production of electricity today, it's now renewable. So it's wind and solar and hydro. And that's where all of the marginal, and now we got El Salvador, they're gonna use volcanoes. Volcano. So it's massive FUD. People should not pay attention to it. And what you gotta do with anything that you hear anywhere, consider the source. Sure. Consider the source. When you hear people talking about the virus, Ask yourself, do they work for a drug company that wants to sell you vaccinations? Do they work for hospitals that want you to do procedures? Or do they work for an independent organization that wants to you know, improve your health? So those exist too. But if you're talking to someone about Bitcoin, do they work for a Bitcoin miner? Do they work for a central bank that doesn't want Bitcoin to replace fiat money? Or do they you know, work for a venture capital fund like me that wants you to invest? I mean. I have my own agenda, but I try to educate first, invest second. Uh, and I think people just have to consider the source. And remember the rule of incumbency. Incumbents will always spread FUD, <laughs> always, right? The, the people who swept the streets in New York, they swept up the horse crap uh, when their horse-drawn carriages did not like horseless carriages because they were going to lose their jobs. So what they do? They spread FUD pamphlets saying, if you got in a horseless carriage, you would die. Yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. But that's what they did. They used their curse of incumbency to try to save their jobs. Now, the funny thing about progress, we have more jobs today than any time in history. More jobs today than any time in history. Now, we've lost more jobs than all of the previous millennia over the last 100 years through progress, technological and, and advancement. But that's good because we create more than we lose. There's a net positive and progress is good. The fact that you and I are talking in real time, right? In video, in 3D, I can see the beads of sweat on your forehead because your camera's so good. I mean, it's amazing. And that didn't exist. In fact, I was watching a TV show with my wife. I can't remember the name of it. And it's basically a, the whole show is a retrospective about the 70s. It's mm -hmm. about a family remembering their life in the 70s. And there's this great one. There's this guy, he comes home and his wife's pissed. She's like, you're late again. You never come home, have dinner with your son and your wife. He says, honey, I've got this algorithm. And I think someday you're going to be able to send a picture using your computer. And he was psyched like out of his mind. And now we're sending live video using our computers. And tomorrow we'll have telepresence and the next day. And so progress is good. Innovation is good. Innovation as an asset class is good. You know, all of what we're talking about around crypto and, and cryptocurrencies and, and uh, blockchain technology is all about this evolution of technology that's been going on since the 50s. It's coming. You're not going to stop it. 
You know, people thought the internet was bad. It was a passing fad. It would never be a big deal. Paul Krugman will never be bigger than the fax machine. Yeah, maybe it's bigger. You know, when this came out, Apple stock went down because people said, why would I buy that? My flip phone works just fine. What do I need a smartphone for? Ask people to give up their smartphone. They'd rather give up their right arm. I mean, no way. So on the topic of innovation uh, in the United States, crypto is allowed to exist. Bitcoin mining is allowed to exist, but yet infrastructure bill, they try to sneak in something there to overtax, to overreach. What are your thoughts on it? Is uh, just lack of education or to your point, the incumbents not liking what's happening? No, look, regulation is how incumbents fight. Mm-hmm. Has always been the case, right? When, when the, the mobile telephony revolution was happening, um, you know, the incumbents, the fixed line wire, you know, tried to pass legislation to stop the wireless. Uh, when, you know, broadband was happening, they tried to pass the net neutrality law to slow down, you know, so that the mom and pop shops wouldn't be displaced by Amazon and e-commerce. And so that's the way the world works. And unfortunately, we live in, in a you know, world where governments overreach on everything. I mean, it's happening all around us and in, in everything. And it's because they like control and they like power. And the problem with governments is they tend toward cronyism, right? They start with capitalism and freedom and democracy, and then they go to cronyism and empirism. And if you think about history, history is replete with examples of empires that became wildly powerful and then failed spectacularly, right? Roman Empire, Ottoman Empire, British Empire, American Empire. And, And it's because cronies don't function right. They try to use regulation to stifle innovation. They try to use uh, regulation to control and, 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 and amass power at the top. And like, it's like inflation, right? Somewhere they bamboozled us yeah. starting in 1913 that rising prices were somehow a good thing. Hmm. Are you kidding me? Think about that. Who does rising prices help? It helps the asset owners at the top of the pyramid. Your real estate prices go up, the price of goods and services go up, so the businesses you own go up. But if you have a fixed income, you're screwed. If you have a minimum wage job, you're screwed. Inflation is a theft of wealth from the middle class and poor to the rich. It's why we have the greatest wealth and income inequality in the history of mankind today. Right. But that's the plan. That, that's the problem, right? That's the plan. And now all the stuff that's going on around us with lockdowns and controls and police states, it's all part of the plan. And, and the nice thing is this movement toward individual sovereignty and freedom, which is what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology is all about. It's about public ledgers. It's about public information. It's about open architecture. It's about shared resources, about the division and eradication of nation states and power structures and cronyism. Mm. All good, but they're going to fight it tooth and nail. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. They're going to fight every step of the way. I believe they'll lose as they they always do, Um, but it doesn't mean it won't be painful along the way. Uh, And this is going to go a little bit off topic, but could blockchain and crypto help solve some of that cronyism where political candidates who are supposed to represent the people, instead of raising money from institutions, they raise money from people. Amen. Look, it is. It is. Look, DAOs are a good example, right? DAOs are organizations owned by the members, Hmm. right? Imagine if our biggest technological giants that we all depend on every day to live our lives weren't owned by one or two people yeah. becoming multi, multi-billionaires and blowing money on trips to the edge of space. Like, what good does that do? Seriously, <laughs> what good does that do? Um, could have saved a lot of people's lives. You know, we have 10 million kids that go to bed every night hungry in this country. Country that spends $20 billion a year on weight loss has 10 million kids who go to bed hungry? Are you kidding me? And we got people blowing hundreds of millions of dollars to go into space? 
mind blowing. So yeah, we could solve a lot of this with, you know, get rid of soft money, right? How if it costs a hundred million dollars to become a senator. How many people have a hundred million dollars? Not that many. So how do they get it? Donations. So if someone donates a hundred million dollars to you, are you indebted to them? Do you owe them favors? Perhaps. That's how lobbying works. Yep. If you look at, at how laws get passed, right? Drugs get approved. Why? Because drug companies spend a lot of money in lobbying. Insurance companies become mandated. You know, the Affordable Care Act, which has nothing to do with affordability or care, has to do with prepaid insurance claims. I mean, why does that even exist? It's not insurance. If I, if I give money to somebody and they pay in an opaque system, that's not insurance. Insurance is where you and I share the risks of if I get sick, I help you help pay for me. And if you get sick, I help pay for you. That's insurance. Right. Right. But that's not what we do. So yeah, there's, there's so many things wrong with cronyism and, and the way the system works today that, that could be solved with openness, with transparency, with, you know, abolition of soft money with, you know, actual rules on, you know, donations so that we wouldn't have, I mean, go back to the founders, right? You spent two years in office and then you went back to your farm. Right. No lifelong politicians, no ability to be in debt to people. You were a volunteer and, you know, country did all right. Got a pretty good foundation. So we're not going to solve it all today here, but ultimately blockchain technology is about freedom. It's about sovereignty. It's about equality. It's about control, personal control. It's about transparency and openness. All of those are things that we should all aspire to and not be afraid of and embrace. Absolutely. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, as we were talking about cronyism and regulations and so forth, Gary Gensler, uh, very well versed in crypto. He, he taught at MIT, yeah. but he's looking for more control to regulate the crypto market, which I don't necessarily think it's a great I mean, idea. look, I, I, I will say I've been very impressed to this point with the SEC and the CFTC's very measured, very considered, very prudent uh, even-handed regulation uh, on on the crypto markets. I think they've done a very good job, right? I do. And but, but, like, oh, that's ridiculous. No, I think they've done a really good job. But even if they didn't have an approved the Bitcoin ETF, I, I don't want to get no, into. No, I think they should approve the Bitcoin ETF. But okay. but I, look, that's that's a that's a politics thing. Go yeah. back to the gold ETF. The gold ETF got held up for three and a half years until. JP Morgan said, okay, now you can do it because we got the other side. So same thing is going to happen here. And the idea that, you know, uh, Jay Clayton used to say, well, the crypto markets are manipulated. You mean different than AMC and GameStop <laughs> or Tesla? Sure. Give me a break. Stop. I mean, yeah. if you want to say, no, the people that pay us and put us in these positions don't want it yet. Fine. Just tell me the truth, but don't make up a lie that's just you know, instantly verifiably false. So look, I think Gensler is very qualified. I think he's he's a great pick. Do I worry that he's in a system that is flawed mm -hmm. and that rewards and incents the wrong behavior to shield the incumbents from innovation and competition? Absolutely. Do I think that it's the big banks who are making the noises around the country to get in the way of the successful, you know, custodians and and uh, blockchain financial service companies that have arisen to date, absolutely. Do I think they'll be able to stop it? Nope. Mm. And do I think at the end of the day, uh, Gensler or whoever else comes in after him will will have to do the right thing and uh, adopt superior technology in a superior way of of controlling and and monetizing value, yes. Mm. But, it, but it'll be a fight and the incumbents are gonna pay a lot of money to make it last or take longer than I would like it to. Sure, I think, I think you summarized it very well there. So there's a lot of eyes on the SEC's lawsuit against Ripple over XRP and, and many folks are looking at the outcome 
because that will be how yeah. the SEC uses to determine, go after Cardano or whatever else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on the whole situation? Look, I, I think, again, Clayton had this great line. I saw him speak once and he said, look, you know, we, the SEC and our predecessors have, have built a pretty good financial system over the years. Mm. Trillions and trillions of dollars of wealth. I think, you know, it's a really good point. You know, we have good regulatory structure, good infrastructure. We're the most trusted name around the world. Companies in China want to list in the United States. Companies in Israel want to list in the United States. Yeah, that's a really good point. So he said, we don't need to trash the whole thing and go completely, uh, you know, decentralized. I'm like, you know, that's a good point. As I said, my dad, he's never going to hold his own keys. He's 83 years old. He's happy to hold Coinbase and have them be the custodian. He knows they're not his keys, not his coins. But just like we put our money in the bank or we have you know, securities in a brokerage, they're not ours, but we, we trust those centralized institutions. So will we go from TradFi to DeFi? No, we'll go from TradFi to CFi to DeFi. And will there be digital natives that go directly to DeFi? Of course, right? Are people today lending and borrowing on Aave? Of course. Are they making money and money market accounts and compound? Of course. Will there be new innovations around that? Will NFTs continue to pop up and, and, and you know, we'll have a digitization of all assets from movie tickets to property titles to, you know, more than just collectibles and beanie babies? Yeah. Or punks? Absolutely. Um, but at the end, they're not mutually exclusive. We need a regulatory regime to have order. We don't want chaos and we don't want everybody competing against other with, without rules. On the other hand, we don't want to use rules from the 1940s to govern the 2040s. So we need some transition and we need some good leadership. And I think we have some young people uh, in the SEC like Hester and others that are actually pretty or younger. I mean, she's not young, but young, younger. Like I think, I think of myself as young. I mean, I'm old, I got white hair, but I still think young. And um, I think it's good to have dialogue and debate and discourse. It's good to have a well-founded structure to build from. It's bad to resist all change because mm. change is coming. Yeah. And if they fight it completely, they're going to lose. And then we might go more to chaos before we get calm. I'd rather see us go to calm. And look, did... Did Ripple do some stuff that probably looks more like a security? In my personal opinion, yeah. That doesn't make me popular with that crowd, but yeah. Um, are other did other people do stuff that was similar? Oh, definitely. And do do all those people need to go to jail? No. Does there need to be rules set up front for people to follow? Absolutely. Yeah. Do we want to punish innovation? No. Do we want to make sure that people follow rules? Yes. Do we want to modify the rules to acknowledge that digital is different than analog, is different than electronic? Absolutely. So I said, I think so far, the SEC has been very measured, very prudent, and very consistent. As long as those three things happen, I feel good about the future. Um, I know we're coming up on time. So I'll, I'll touch on a few things here. What's your take on the state of the economy? Obviously, we talked about inflation, some money printing. Do you see the stock market also having a big correction soon? You know, I, 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 I've been wrong about the market correcting for a long time. And the market is wildly overvalued, the stock market. I mean, like levels that are incomprehensible to any logical person. But what, what's missing in that analysis is the denominator. The denominator is being destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. Central banks around the world are destroying fiat currencies. And so what's happening is called money illusion, right? You have the nominal value of assets rising, whether it's real estate, art, fine wine, collectible cars, or stocks. But if you, it's interesting, if you look at stocks, they're making new all-time highs. If you look at stocks relative to the Fed balance sheet, they're dead flat since 2008. If yeah. you look at them denominated in gold instead of dollars, they're actually dead flat since 1996. Mm. If you look at it denominated in Bitcoin, they're down. So 
it's all about the denominator. If you denominate in dollars, things look great. Like Venezuela, best performing stock market the last three years. <laughs> How many Venezuelan stocks did you want to own? Right. Zero. Because the boulevard went literally to shit. Um, I would say, pardon my French. And then I say, but a Frenchman once said to me, why do you say that? We're not vulgar. And I actually never Googled why we say pardon my French. So I probably should Google it. But uh, I, I think the economy is weak. I think it's being held up with steroid shots. And once the steroid shots wear off, which they started to do in, in April, uh, the rate of M2 growth globally started to fall. Uh, China has withdrawn a lot of stimulus, and that's why Chinese equities have struggled. It's why global equities have been bouncing around and, and U.S. equities, particularly, it's basically just the fangs, right? We have bad breadth. The breadth of the market isn't that great. The top of the market is very strong. And, and they're just at crazy valuations. Apple, it's a great company, not worth two and a half trillion dollars. It's not worth that. I mean, they have the same revenues that they had six years ago, but the revenues per share are up because, I'm sorry, the same earnings as six years ago, but their earnings per share up because they bought back stock. Yeah, It's just money illusion, right? That's just financial accounting. So I think ultimately we're going to have a day of reckoning, but it's not going to be soon. And as long as they keep approving mythical, you know, MMT, you know, modern monetary theory, which is really just disaster. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the idea that you can print your way to prosperity yeah. is ludicrous. If that were true, every country would do it and every country would fail. And every country that's ever tried it in the history of mankind has failed. It will fail this time too. So that's why it's okay to own some stocks. It's okay to own some bonds. It's okay to you know pay for your assets in fiat, but you got to get off zero and you got to you know diversify into the digital asset realm because those will store value in a superior way to, to fiat. Mark, always a pleasure chatting with you. And I always learned so much. And I hope that you would one day maybe run for office or something. Ah, you are, you're very kind. <laughs> I, 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 that is very, very kind. I'll tell you one funny story. So um, look, I, I do like to teach. I mean, I, I like to have these conversations. I, I like to, to talk about education stuff. And I always say I live my life in chapters. So chapter one, I work for not-for-profits. Chapter two, I built Morgan Creek Capital Management. Chapter three, I'm building Morgan Creek Digital. And chapter four, I will teach. I'll go back and, and teach. And so I was, I was given a presentation a number of years ago out in LA. And uh, these two um, guys came up to me, uh, two Iranian brothers, uh, Persian, I guess, Persian brothers, uh, if you're in LA, um, came and said, oh my God, we want to back you. <laughs> Whatever you want to run for, we want to back you. I'm like, well, I don't know you, but okay, I'm flattered, but why? He said, you just have a great way of communicating and and you elicit trust. And I'm like, hmm, that's, that's a really high compliment. Thank you very much. But I, I just don't think I have it in me to, <laughs> to be in politics. As I, I just spent the five days in DC uh, with my son and my parents and, uh, you know, did all the museums and the, and the, the monuments. And it was nice because they were out of session. So it was kind of calm and we had kind of the city to ourselves. And I love DC. I mm. mean, it's the new Rome. It's beautiful. The architecture is great. The food is great. And people are doing really well in DC. Lots of fancy cars, high-end restaurants, prices are high. Um, but I love DC, but I don't love politics. And you know, I, I'm actually friendly uh, with Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg. His dad and I were close friends and uh, God rest his soul. And, and you know, Pete's now Secretary of Commerce. And uh, I, I feel for him. I mean, he, he lives to serve and I admire him so greatly for that. And, and he, has, he has planted the flag and he'll probably be our president someday. And I, I would love that. And I have a Pete 2020 sign on my desk. Um, but <laughs> I just, I just couldn't do it, but you're, you're very nice to say it. It's a, it's a high compliment. I take it as such. And, uh, I, I, I do enjoy, uh, dialogue and debate. So, well, if you ever change your mind, you got my vote. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> maybe you'll we'll be, to, maybe we'll have to come up with, uh, maybe I can run to be, uh, a, a head of a Dow somewhere. Maybe, maybe I could, I could handle that. 
Yeah, something blockchain and crypto related. I mean, there we go. All right, I'm gonna put my I'm thinking cap on. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank <laughs> you.